Please turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. We are looking today at a mysterious, fascinating passage uh, in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all include this story. It's called the Transfiguration of Jesus. And I'm going to go ahead and read it for us. This is Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. And this is the word of the Lord. Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that Elijah, that, that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we all know that whenever we try to communicate uh, or even to comprehend the fullness of what is in any passage of Your Word, that we will fall short. Uh, but this text, I think even more so than usual, we feel that we are on holy ground and that we are going to fall far short of what is really here in this text and what is revealed about Your Son. So God, I pray that You would do what only You can do, which is to illumine the eyes of the heart. Uh, If it's just me up here talking, uh, it will do no good. Uh, I pray that by Your Spirit that You would illuminate this text, that You would allow us to comprehend it better, and that the eyes of our heart would actually catch a glimpse of the glory of God in the face of Christ that is seen so vividly in this passage and that was seen by Peter and James and John. So God, help us not be the same after encountering the Christ of this text. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've titled the sermon very simply, The Transfiguration, and I have three uh, pretty simple points as well. Uh, Point number one is Jesus' glorious transfiguration. Point number two, Moses and Elijah's appearance. And point number three, Peter's two responses. So let's begin with point number one, Jesus' glorious transfiguration. Before I can really jump into the first verse of our text. We have to put this in context, and Scott preached the last sermon, and then I preached before that, and we need to look back over the last two sermons to understand what is happening at this moment and why this story takes place where it is. Um, Tom Schreiner is one of my favorite New Testament theologians. His son, Patrick Schreiner, wrote a whole book recently on the transfiguration, whole book just on the transfiguration, and I have not read all of it yet, but I've been working through some of it. I've been listening to him talk about it, and he just said, we've undervalued this story. This is a story that a lot of us as evangelicals don't quite know what to do with. It's a bit of a strange story, and it's hard to know beyond the surface level of the text what it is. I think we all know it's significant, but we don't quite know how to connect the dots, and so I've been challenged to think more about this in that regard, and the context is going to be of service to us. So if you can remember, I won't read the verses, all of them, I'll just paraphrase here. Jesus says He takes the disciples north into Caesarea Philippi, north of the Holy Land. You remember this? And he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? And they say, well, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And remember, Peter gets it right momentarily. What does Peter say? 
you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're right, the Father has revealed that to you. A moment later, as we heard uh, from Scott last week, what does Peter say? Next, when Jesus says he's going to be crucified, Peter says, Lord, may it never be. You, you don't need to be crucified. So here's what we're discovering. The first, for, for many chapters now, the question has been, who is Jesus? And now for the first time in vivid clarity, the question has been answered by a divine illumination of the Father into Peter's heart. What does Peter say? You are the Messiah. That's the answer. You're the Messiah. He gets it right. But what does Peter get wrong? The kind of Messiah he's going to be. Peter thinks he's going to conquer his enemies, which he will one day. But now he's come to be conquered by his enemies and to take our sin. And so Jesus is redefining what the Messiah is. And in the midst of all that, he wants to remind his disciples that he wants to teach them two massive lessons. And we need to learn these lessons. Number one, if you want to follow the biblical Jesus, there is going to be a cross that you have to bear. Isn't that what Jesus said last week? Take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus says, I'm a Messiah, but I'm a cross-bearing Messiah. Not the kind you think. I'm not going to be the kind you think. I'm going to have a cross on my back, and I'm going to be taken out to Golgotha. I'm, that's the kind of Messiah I am. And if you want to be my disciple, you're going to be treated like I'm being treated. You've got to take up your own cross and follow me. But Jesus does not want to end on a note of despair. And so what does he say? He says, if you follow me and you give up your life for my sake, you're going to get back glory in eternity. And so here are the two concepts, the cross and the crown, right? The cross of shame and the crown of glory. And Jesus is saying, any theology that gets rid of one of those two is heresy. If you have a theology that says it's just a life of suffering, it's just a life of cross-bearing, and there's no glory and joy in eternity, then you do not have Christianity. If it's a cross without a crown, it's not the Bible. It's not Christianity. It's not Jesus. If, on the other hand, you have a crown without a cross, which is far more popular today in false teaching, a crown without a cross, prosperity without adversity, right, riches without suffering, if that's the teaching, well, then you also have the heresy of the prosperity gospel. And Jesus wants to eliminate both false teachings. He says, listen, I am a Messiah who's carrying a cross, but I'm also a Messiah who is one day going to be glorified in my Father's presence with the glory I had in eternity past, and I'm going to come back in glory with my angels, and you are going to see me break up over the sky like a lightning bolt from east to west, and no one is going to miss it on that day, and I'm going to come with a crown, many diadems on my head, the name King of kings and Lord of lords on my robe and on my thigh with a sword coming out of my mouth, and I'm going to have fire in my eyes, and I'm going to come to bring judgment on my enemies and to save my people. There is a crown coming, but it doesn't come before the cross. The cross comes, and then comes the crown. Now look back in, in chapter 16. Let's just see it in the text. Verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, this is Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. I know this is a controversial text. I know people I love. R.C. Sproul, I'm going to disagree with him. I'm going to disagree with a whole bunch of people I love on this point. But I still think that there is a way to understand what this verse means. I, people debate, what does this mean? Some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Some people think this refers to 70 AD, 40 years later when the, when the temple is going to be destroyed. Some people think it's referring to the gospel advanced throughout the Great Commission. Some people think it's referring to the resurrection of Jesus or the day of Pentecost. Some people think it's referring to Christ's final second coming. Certainly can't be that because none of the disciples are still alive. So that's, that's not true. Uh, but wh which is it? And People I respect take different views, but I am just telling you, I'm just personally persuaded of a view. I think Jesus is saying this. Listen, guys, I'm a Messiah. I'm a Messiah with a cross. After the cross comes the glory and the crown, and I'm going to come back one day, and you're going to see it publicly. And some of you standing here are going to see the Son of Man coming in glory before you die. I think what Jesus is saying is this. I'm going to come back visibly one day in the second coming, and some of you right here in front of me are going to get a sneak preview of coming attractions before that happens. Before you die, you're going to see a glimpse of my coming in glory, and it's going to happen before some of you have died, before you've died. And I think he's referring to the Mount of Transfiguration. 
And this is actually, I, I, if you don't believe me, let's just stick with me through the message. I, I hope it'll become more persuasive. I think what Jesus is saying is this, because soon I am going to be crucified and buried, you disciples, you need hope that I'm going to live beyond the grave and that I'm going to have a glorious return one day, and I'm going to give you a glimpse of it right now. You know, maybe a movie's coming out you want to see, and you want to see that movie trailer, and you watch the two-minute trailer, and you kind of get a sense of the movie. You go, oh, maybe I'm not going to like that movie. Maybe I am going to like that movie. Maybe I'll see it. Maybe I won't. But the movie trailer is to give you that little sample of what is to come in the, in the, in the, in the full version. The Mount of Transfiguration is a sneak preview of two massive realities. Two massive realities. One is Jesus' future coming in glory. The other one, I believe, is His pre-existent eternal glory with the Father as the eternally begotten Son of the Father in an eternity past. I think you're getting a glimpse of both of those things on the mountain, and this is to bolster and encourage the disciples for a very difficult life. So if you think the Mount of Transfiguration is not practical because it's a strange story of Jesus shining on a mountain, which seems very strange, what is the point of that story? Just to boil it down, here's the point. As a Christian, your life is going to be hard, and you need to have a vision of Christ's transfiguration to put steel in your spine to know that no matter what I go through, whatever cross-bearing I may endure in this life, guess what? Jesus is coming in glory, and I know He's coming in glory because Peter, James, and John were eyewitnesses to the preview of His coming in glory. They saw it with their own eyes, and therefore they know that what they're saying is true, and if what they saw really happened, we can be sure that that assures us of His second coming one day. With that in mind, let's move here to... Let me quote one thing here. John 17, before, the night before Jesus died, you don't have to turn there, the high priestly prayer, Jesus says this, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. See, that's the preexistent glory that we get a glimpse of here, and it's also the future coming glory that we get a glimpse of in this scene. Look with me at verse 5 of Matthew 17. He was still speaking... Peter was, when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. What is this about? That that, that phrase, a bright cloud overshadowed them, I don't don't want to lose you here, but We just mentioned this in Sunday school, of all things. At the end of Exodus, the last paragraphs of Exodus, they've spent, what, 15 chapters building the tabernacle? A lot of instructions, a lot of details. They finish the tabernacle, and what happens? The glory of God, the cloud of God's presence and glory comes down, and the same Greek word, overshadowed or filled, same exact Greek word, filled the tabernacle to where Moses was afraid to enter. And now what's happening? God's glory cloud has come down again, and this time, where is it? It's overshadowing Jesus the true temple of God, the true presence of God. Here it is coming over the disciples at this moment, and God's voice, the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Now, this is echoing all kinds. If you know your Old Testament well, there's lots in your mind. Exodus 4.22, God calls Israel, the nation, my firstborn son. Pharaoh, let my firstborn son go that he may worship me. And Jesus, the true Israel, is God's firstborn son, his true one and only son. Number two, Jesus is the true Davidic king or son of David. Remember 2 Samuel chapter 7? God says, David, I'm going to put one of your sons on my throne, and I will be a father to him, and he will be my son. And Jesus is the ultimate Davidic king. He is God's son. And then finally, As the eternally begotten, unique Son of God, Jesus is the Son par excellence, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God. All those references are in mind when Jesus is called the beloved Son of the Father. And the Father says to listen to Him. With Moses standing by, it's not hard to imagine what this is referring to, Exodus 18. Moses wrote, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me, and you will listen to Him. And whoever does not listen to him, of him it will be required. 
What's the point? When the true and better Moses comes on the scene, you've got to pay attention and listen to him or there will be judgment. And Jesus is the true and better Moses. And so what happens? The Father says, listen to him. Listen to the greater Moses. Now here, just think about this. At Jesus' baptism, do we hear very similar words? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Here at the Mount of Transfiguration, same kind of words, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. People have pointed us out that not, not long after this story, when Jesus carries the cross to Golgotha, when he is crucified, when he's hanging there uh, on the cross, this would perhaps be the moment where you most want to hear the affirmation from, the, from heaven, this is my beloved son. And yet in that moment, what happens? Is there a voice from heaven when Jesus is on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No, there is no voice from heaven. Why? Because our sin has been placed on the sin bearer, and Jesus, the spotless sacrifice, has taken our place and become our curse, and therefore in that moment, he receives the spiritual abandonment of the Father. Without separating the unity of the Trinity, God the Father turned his back on Christ and his humanity, and Christ experienced agony and separation from God because of our sin, and so that God could say to us, I will never leave you, or forsake you. Point number two, Moses and Elijah's appearance. This is strange. Why do Moses and Elijah appear? Let's look back at verse two. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Peter said to him, Lord, it is good that we're here if you wish. I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Someone's asked, why these two individuals? Why not King David, Solomon, Abraham, Noah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel? Why, why Moses and Elijah? And I think there's a pretty big, pretty big consensus here. Moses represents the law. Elijah is a stand-in for the prophets. So you've got Moses, the law, and the prophets. You've got the entirety of Old Testament revelation, in a sense, represented by these two individuals, the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. And guess what? They come to appear before Christ. What's the purpose of that? Well, see, Jesus is the fulfillment of all that Moses and all that the prophets have written. Jesus says in John chapter 5, Moses wrote about me. And he says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms will have its fulfillment in Luke 24. So Jesus sees all the law and the prophets ultimately fulfilled in him, which is why it's amazing. When all the, when, when, when literally when the smoke clears, when the, when the clouds clears away, only Jesus is left. Why? Jesus is superior to Moses. He's superior to Elijah. He is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scriptures, and he is infinitely greater than Moses. He is infinitely greater than Elijah. He is not to be put on the same playing field as these other individuals. You may also remember our Old Testament ends. You know the last two paragraphs of Malachi? It ends talking about who? Moses and Elijah. It says, remember the law of my servant Moses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before that great and awesome day. The Old Testament ends talking about Moses and Elijah, and they show up here at the Mount of Transfiguration speaking with Jesus. I just have to add this. Luke adds a detail that Matthew and Mark do not. We're told in Luke that they, Moses and Elijah appeared in glory and spoke to Jesus about his exodus, is the Greek word, his departure. So you've got Moses, the man of the exodus, talking to Jesus about his exodus in Jerusalem that would be soon accomplished. Tom Schreiner writes this, Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets, appear and talk with Jesus, speaking of his exodus in Jerusalem, showing Jesus' death as the pathway to glory. Jesus is going to be like the Passover lamb who dies for sin, is risen, and then gives us an entryway into the new creation by his ascension into heaven. There's more here. Look back at verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. Why, why after six days? We don't get a lot of time indicators like this uh, in these Gospels, so they must have some significance. Um, why six days? Well, I'm not sure, but number one, I think it's definitely linking what Jesus just said about His coming with what's happening on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's a direct link. But number two, 
The six days may, may, may be significant because in Exodus 24, remember this, when the old covenant is inaugurated with blood, Moses gets to Mount Sinai, he walks up the mountain, and he sees the glory of God, and he's, they wait six days. And then on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses out of the cloud, and Moses entered the cloud and went up in the mountain. It's a very similar scene, and there's a six-day number connected to it. So perhaps there's an echo of that scene there. But I think there's something more important going on here with Moses. We know the story in Exodus chapter 34, still at Mount Sinai. Moses goes up the mountain. He's there 40 days and 40 nights. He comes down with the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. And what happens? His face is glowing from the glory of God. This is not unlike what happens to Jesus, but it is unlike. Moses comes down the mountain and his face is glowing. He doesn't even know that. The people are terrified. He has to put a veil over his face because the skin of his face shone. But Moses was what? He was reflecting the glory of Yahweh. He'd been hidden in the cleft of the rock. The glory of Yahweh passed by. My face you shall not see, but I will show you my, my back, the Lord says. So Moses hidden in the cleft. The glory of the Lord passed by. He sees the back of the Lord, and it is so radiant that it reflects off his face for a matter of days when he comes off the mountain. But Jesus is not just better than Moses. He's infinitely better than Moses. Uh, if Moses is like the moon and reflecting glory, Jesus is the sun. He is the source of the glory. Jesus is not reflecting the glory of God. He's producing the glory of God because He's God. It's the glory of God that is shining from the face of Jesus. It originates with Him. It doesn't originate with Moses. Jesus is of another category than Moses, although there are similarities between the two stories. But here's something really fascinating. On that mountain still, Exodus 33, Moses says, Please, Lord, show me your glory. And that scene happens that I just described. Remember what the Lord says? My face shall not be seen. Remember that? That's what the Lord says. You'll die. If anyone sees my face, you'll die. You cannot see my face. You'll see my back. And that's what Moses sees. The wish that Moses asked for, which was to see God, is actually not fully granted at Mount Sinai. Moses gets his wish answered 1,400 years later at Mount of Transfiguration. Because now Moses sees the glory of God face to face. And the glory of God is shining from the face of Jesus. When Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the glory of God in the face of Christ, he's reflecting on this scene because he said, okay, I don't want to lose everybody here with verse references, okay? 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says this, the old, the old covenant was, uh, was written on stone. It was a ministry of death. It could not renew the heart. And Moses is a reflection of that because the glory he had on his face was fading. But the glory of the new covenant is a superior glory. It's not going to fade. It's the glory from Christ. It's the glory shining from his face. And it is infinitely superior to Moses uh, because the glory that's passing away cannot, take, uh, cannot be greater than the glory of that which lasts. And then Paul says, we have seen the glory of God in the face of Christ. Moses is getting his wish answered finally on this mountain where he sees God's glory in the face of Jesus. What is Elijah doing here, though? What else can we learn from Elijah? Now, th this is really interesting. I don't have time to unpack the whole story. But let's just say a, a little bit of a, a statement. Let's say something here about it. 1 Kings 18, Elijah goes up against the prophets of Baal. We know the story, right? Calls down fire from heaven. The prophets of Baal produce nothing after screaming all day for Baal. Nothing happens. He douses his sacrifice with water. Fire comes from heaven, burns up everything. And Elijah goes, I finally got my wish. Uh, the Lord has proven himself. Yahweh is the true God. The prophets of Baal have been discredited. They are put to death. And now he's probably, I think, I don't want to psychologize the man. I think Elijah is probably thinking this is going to be the turning point in the ministry. I've just publicly, God has just publicly shown Yahweh is God, not Baal. This is going to be a revival in Israel. And the revival never comes in Elijah's life. Instead, the very next chapter, what happens? Elijah finds out that Jezebel, that evil queen, has not had a change of heart. She says, he killed my prophets of Baal. He'll be dead tomorrow just like they are. And she's after Elijah. And Elijah asked for God to take his own life. That is a very strange change within about 24 hours. He goes from a mountaintop experience conquering the prophets of Baal to God, kill me a day later. How is that possible? And the answer is the, the, the dream, the aspiration of his life was to see Israel brought to repentance. And he finds out on the mountaintop, it's not going to happen. God says, I've kept for myself a remnant, 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal, but I'm, the whole nation is not going to turn to repentance at this time. It's not going to happen. In fact, Jezebel and Ahab are after you. And 
Elijah is absolutely broken over this, and he doesn't know what to do. The Lord gives him sleep, provides him with food. Remember, an angel provides him with food, and he goes 40 days and 40 nights, just like Moses on that meal. And where does Elijah go? He goes far away to Mount Sinai. He goes to the same mountain where, where, where Moses was, called Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, same mountain. He shows up at Mount Sinai all alone, and the Lord says, um, Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> so he actually says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've done everything I can do, and they're seeking my life to kill me. And what happens? This is the text. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. Same exact words when the Lord passed by Moses, on the same mountain. It's amazing. So here's Elijah. The same, some people think the cave he was in may have been the cleft of the rock. We don't know that. That's what some people speculate. I don't know if that's true. But he's on the same mountain for sure, and now God is going to pass by, just like he did Moses. And what happens? There is a windstorm, but the Lord wasn't in that. There was a fire, earthquake. The Lord was not in that. Then there's what? A still, small voice. Elijah wraps his face so he can't see the fullness of God's glory. He goes out, and, and God speaks to him as his face is wrapped in a cloak. And what happens? Elijah never gets the fullness of what he wanted in his life until the Mount of Transfiguration. Now he sees God with no hindrance for his vision, and he sees that all that he ever wanted for God to bring about the salvation of his people is going to come true through the ministry of Christ and his apostles as they spread across the world. Elijah is finding his hopes satisfied in Jesus at this special mountain. Look at verse 9 of Matthew 17. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not, they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So a little... Footnote about biblical interpretation. It's not the main point of the passage, but it's worth mentioning. This is why we need the Old Testament, excuse me, this is why we need the New Testament to best understand and clarify the Old Testament. Greg and I have labored this point in Sunday school, but I think this is a very important point. The New Testament sheds greater light on what the Old Testament means. The Old Testament is a room richly furnished but dimly lit, as B.B. Warfield said. And we want to turn the lights up. And here's why I say that. Malachi said this, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and powerful day of the Lord. If you take that literalistically at face value, it means the same man Elijah who never died and went up in a fiery chariot would himself come back and prepare the way of the Lord. But that's not what happened. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah and fulfilled the ministry of Elijah. So when the Old Testament says Elijah is coming, it doesn't mean it literalistically. It means someone in the spirit and power of Elijah is going to come, which is John the Baptist. You would not be able to figure that out without the New Testament revelation. You see? So the New Testament always, it doesn't contradict the Old Testament. It gives greater clarity of what the Old Testament meant originally. And that's a huge point for, for a subject for another day, but that's something to keep in mind. Now I want to settle on Peter. And this may take an extra minute, but I think it's worth our time. I want to talk about Peter. So point number three, Peter's two responses. You've got his, and what do I mean by that? I mean his response when this is happening live, which is bumbling and sort of he doesn't know what to do, he kind of puts his foot in his mouth. That's normal, Peter. We've all been there. And then I want to give you a second response to the scene that Peter gave over 30 years later, after much further reflection. And they're quite different. So let's look at response number one from Peter. I, this always makes me laugh. Uh, I don't know if it should or not, but Peter just says things before thinking. Look with me here at verse three one more time. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now, just, just stop for a second, okay? We're told in Luke's gospel that they were sleeping and they woke up. This may have happened at night, which would have made the, the light from Christ even more shocking and blinding. So we're told they were asleep at the time. So maybe it was evening. And Peter wakes up. And what he sees is Jesus shining brightly, as bright as the sun. Mark says his his clothes were whiter than any launderer could bleach them. That's, that's what it says. Any, any launderer could make them. That's what it says in Mark's gospel. Uh, that's an amazing statement. So he, his, his clothing is supernaturally white. It's not natural what, what his clothes are doing. It's like a heavenly being, but he's beyond a heavenly being. He's not an angel. This is divine and human mixed here. This is, this is fully God, fully man in this moment. And he, they wake up. Peter wakes up from his nap. 
Jesus is shining like the sun. Moses and Elijah have appeared in glory and are talking to Jesus. Peter's wiping the sleep out of his eyes, trying to figure out what to do. I mean, what would you do in this? This is an unusual setting. Peter's like, uh, Lord, this is a great place for us to be right now. Um, why don't we make a couple of, why don't we make three tents and one for Elijah, one for Moses, one for you. We'll just stay here for a long time. This is going to be great. And it says, Peter did not know what he was saying. What he, Peter did not know what to say. I think it's what Mark or Luke say. So Peter just says something. What is Peter thinking? Let, let, me, quote, uh, let me quote Tom Schreiner. Luke remarks that Peter does not understand the import of what he is saying, for he is suggesting that Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are equally important. Thus, he completely misses the significance of what's happening. God is present with his people in Jesus. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So Peter's first response was not good. But let's leave this text. You can leave Matthew, and let's go to the back of your New Testament to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I just want to spend a moment on this before we end this, the message. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll just speak personally for a moment. I've known of this text for many years. I have never quite known what to make of what Peter is saying in this passage. And I'm not saying I've got it figured out now perfectly for sure, but I think it's the first time in my Christian life that I'm actually understanding better what Peter is saying in this chapter. For 20 years, I have, I think, been just not understanding. I think at least something became clearer to me in the last couple of weeks. And maybe you already know this, but I, I want to at least present it to you because I think it's pretty amazing. Before I get into this, let me just take a second here to say something about 2 Peter. Okay, follow me here. The transfiguration happened around AD 30. Or just use approximates here, about 30. He writes 2 Peter near his death somewhere in the 60s AD, okay? So this is over 30 years later. Peter's had plenty of time to reflect on this event, and here's what I always want for 20 years. I mean, this is, again, this is new to me. For 20 years, I always wondered in the back of my mind, of all the events Peter could pick to defend the truthfulness of Christ, of all the things he saw that he could re reach back and refer to, why does he mention the transfiguration only as his main point in this chapter? It never made perfect sense to me. Why pick that one to defend his point? And I think it's making sense now. Here's my argument, and you can test it with Scripture. Here's what I think is happening. If you're familiar with 2 Peter, you're like, we didn't come to hear about 2 Peter. Oh, okay, just hang on, hang on. 2 Peter, three chapters. Paul, Peter, <laughs> let me get his name right. Peter is dealing in chapter 1 with living a godly life in a difficult time. He says, don't give up, you'll, you'll be welcomed into a heavenly, uh, you'll, you'll have a heavenly entryway into heaven, and you'll make your calling and election sure, so stay, persevere in the faith is chapter one, in part. Chapter two, if you look, he is giving an intense rebuke to false teachers, intense rebuke of false prophets and teachers. And then chapter three, he clarifies what the false teachers are saying, amongst other things. And you know what the false prophets are saying, the false teachers are saying? They're saying, Jesus is not coming back. That's what their argument is. Look with me real quick. Look at verse, uh, this is chapter 3 of 2 Peter. Just follow me for a second here. Verse 3. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, and he goes on. Now do you see here? The false teachers are saying what? Jesus is not coming back. Are you kidding me? It's been how many years and he hasn't come back? How can you possibly believe in this kind of mythology? They're scoffing about the second coming. So you, you following? Here's 2 Peter. I'm oversimplifying it. Chapter 1, persevere in godliness and prove yourself to be a true Christian. Chapter 2, there are many false teachers threatening people with, with eternal destruction. Chapter 3, one of the things they're teaching is Jesus is not coming back. That's a myth. Okay? And in the context of all that, what does Peter do to defend the second coming? He talks about the transfiguration, which fits exactly what we saw in the Gospels. Follow me here. Second Peter 1, look at verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you 
the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention. Now stop there. Do you see Peter's argument? He says, guys, in order to persevere in the faith, the only way you're going to make it through the hard times of being a Christian is knowing Jesus is coming back to save us. He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's, that's what we're waiting for. So you've got to believe that's going to happen or you're going to give up. Why would you keep walking with Jesus if you don't think he's really coming back? I mean, that would just ruin all of Christianity. We're of all people most to be pitied if he didn't rise and if he's not coming back. So Peter says, listen, I guarantee you he's coming back. And let me prove it to you. The scoffers are wrong. I will prove it to you. Ready? I was an eyewitness on the Mount of Transfiguration of his second coming glory as a preview. I saw a preview of his second coming on the Mount of Transfiguration when the Father bore witness to him. I saw it and I heard it. I'm not lying. This is not a cleverly devised myth. This isn't Aesop's fables. This isn't some sort of morality tale with some moral lesson. I'm talking about real time and space history. There's an actual mountain I could take you to. We were standing on that actual mountain and this particular day when Jesus shone with the glory that he's going to come back with on that day. Listen, I'm not making this up. You can bank everything on Christ. He rose. He is coming back. Don't let the scoffers get the best of you. He, he, he will do exactly what he said he would do. So let me close the message like this. L look with me now at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So life is going to be hard. There's a cross to bear. We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus because by seeing his glory in Scripture, we are transformed into his image from one degree of glory to the next. I know I've got to end now. I'm sorry. I've got to add one thing. You're like, you really don't. I, I do. I do. I do. I'm going to add this. The word he was transfigured, right? In, in Matthew and Luke, he was transfigured before them. That Greek word is only used four times in the New Testament. Luke doesn't even use it. Matthew and Mark say he was transfigured before them. The word where we get the word metamorphosis in English. Uh, the only other two times that word is used in the New Testament, it's about you. And it's amazing. Two of them. Romans 12, 2, you probably know, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transfigured, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Same Greek word, Jesus was transfigured. Then here's the other one. This one is amazing. It's one of our favorite sanctification verses at this church. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, after just talking about Moses' face glowing, what does Paul say? We all, Christians, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, Jesus, are being transfigured, transformed into the same glory from one degree of glory to the next. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That's amazing. So again, as we go through a difficult life with a cross on our back, we look to Jesus and we ourselves are transformed. We're transformed by seeing His glory and ultimately we trust that one day He will come back in glory and He will rescue us from every evil deed and He will deliver us safely into His kingdom. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, I do ask that you would show us that the glory of the one creator God can only be seen in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not seen in any other religious leader. He's not seen in any other human being. If you want to see the glory of Yahweh, the God of Israel, you must look into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ because the glory of God shines brightly in the face of Christ. And as we behold that glory, we ourselves are transformed 
from one degree of glory to the next, knowing that He will come back, He will right all wrongs, He will save His people, and He will judge His enemies. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.